speech. Firstly, a few points of setup. Secondly, I guess it's a point in three parts, which is firstly, improving the efficiency of the system. Secondly, improving the kinds of research that gets done. And thirdly, talking about why we still get an equal funding overall. Four things on setup. Well, three things on, four things on setup, I guess. The first thing to say is that the way that the grants work in the current system is simply that you have to fill up a number of grant applications, either to the university that you work for or you're affiliated with, and also to a number of external institutions, which might be a government, it might be corporations, etc. The thing I want to note here is just that this is a very costly and time-consuming pre time consuming process, which is to say you have to do some like external research to back up why your project might be particularly useful. You have to like write a water grant application that is a lot of time. Second thing to note here is simply the way that we would implement this model, which is that two things that you would have to do to pass these kind of minimum standards. First thing, you would still have to pass the standards of ethical boards, which is to say they're quite good at determining when you're like working with human subjects, whether this is going to be a particularly uneth unethical way to interact with them. That's something we think is done well under the status quo. But secondly, I think you have to demonstrate some significance of your project. The thing we would note here, you don't have to demonstrate that it would be immediately apparent, but maybe that you are making inquiries into a field that could be useful in the future, or that it generally has a value to society. We would note here would make this barrier particularly easy to pass, just because we want more research to be considered under this 50%. Third thing to note here is simply we would uh, allocate funding for a term of time. You would not have to restart this process each year, which is to say if you're doing like a seven year study, we would approve that study for the length of its time. Last thing to note here is just the way we classify scientific research is like most areas of research in the status quo, which is simply to say that when things like sociology and the social sciences papers appear in scientific journals, we think that that should be classified and it should be included under the types of research that we do. Three things in this point about how we improve the general quality of research. Firstly, on efficiency. First is just a framing that I want to provide here, which is just that there are a set of projects that have a clear and immediate benefit to society. That is a set of projects which would clearly be allocated money in the 50% that is still available and under the choice of the universities, not under the lottery system, which is to say that they would clearly see that if it has a future really important benefit to humans, then they would like obviously give that money to the project under either world. We would also know that they're probably able to get exterior funding from corporations or the government, where it has particularly good externalities that are apparent straight away. First thing to note, why is the rest of the research just good in general? I would just like to provide a couple of reasons here, which is just that academics are quite good at their jobs and generally are able to provide research in a good way, which is a first thing that they have simply a large amount of experience and time in the field, which increases their expertise and their choice of what to research, and they're likely to do it in particularly good ways because of that time investment. But also notice that you just like, are simply likely to be more qualified because you have to go through a massive degree of education. Like you have to spend like 10 years in like the university system learning about a specific field to be qualified enough to do super specific research in it. Last thing we would know is they simply care about the field, which is to say they're likely to pursue particularly good results or want to do their research in a way that is particularly good and important. Three things to note on why grants are bad at distributing, uh, why they're bad at distributing grants in the status quo. First thing to note here is the grant assessors don't have experience in the field often. This simply means that it's often quite hard to quickly comprehend the potential benefits or at all, which means they either do not understand the potential benefit of a project, or they have to spend a vast amount of time that they could be assessing other research projects in, determining on what the value or what that specific project is about. This would take a long time and often note the hyper-specific nature of research. Stuff like research into specific areas of the human cell is quite difficult for a random assessor to comprehend. Second thing to note here is that they often preference particularly compelling writing because it appears to them immediately 
ideally, that this is something that they should listen to and that they should care about because they're instantly persuaded by it, that means that they're more likely to preference that over thorough research or research that has otherwise very, very good outcomes. The third thing to note here is at least that they have a lot of grants to get through in terms of quantity, which is to say that at the point where the grant system becomes incredibly competitive because you have large amounts of people writing grants, you then get denied more from different groups. And as an individual researcher, you have to apply to more and more places and increase the saturation of grants in a view of the, like, to, to try and keep seeking out more research and seek out approval for your projects. That simply means that it just keeps increasing and it keeps becoming more difficult for you to get grants. And it takes longer and longer time each time as the saturation of the market for grants increases. That is particularly bad and waste time in a number of ways. Two ways that we're going to give you. Firstly, it just means that researchers waste a bunch of time writing grants that they could be actually researching. That just takes away from the time you spend on projects. That means less projects get done, and they get done in worse ways. That was harmful. But secondly, know that often during research, instead of doing it to the greatest extent or in a particularly thorough way, you are looking forward to your next project. And note in the context of the casualization of academics, and note the instability of the academic profession, it means that often you are looking more for job security because that is simply the only choice that you have to remain employed. That was a calculus that you did, and that meant that your research was getting done worse because you instead had to focus on writing the next 20 grants to the next 20 institutions so you could get your next project and stay employed. We would note also the odds of, like, they just simply waste massive time, whereas on the outside, researchers do not have to constantly pivot and shift to find the best potential product for the odds of a grant, and they're able to do things like better research what grant would be most effective or what research project would be the best to pursue initially, which means that you're just not wasting time on extraneous research, and we also just waste a significant amount less money because you're able to do that research in better ways. That is simply that we get a much more efficient process. Secondly, on the different kinds of research funded, we just simply note that the status quo different kinds of research under them. Three potential reasons why they might be. Firstly, it might simply be less visible or boring research, which is to say that it's not targeted specifically towards humans or providing benefits explicitly towards humans. Or secondly, it just might simply be less easily published because it's less like sexy for an academic journal to publish some in-depth study about fungal research, for example, where, where it still has benefits. Second thing is that it simply might be just difficult to express, for example, if you are an ESL researcher, it might be hard for you to express uh, to like express to a researcher why it's valuable, you're likely to get discriminated, discriminated against in that way. But thirdly, if it's cross-disciplinary research, you often just don't have a large body of research to back up. Why like your specific interest and your specific product is likely to be useful because you don't have explicit benefits that you can point to from previous studies in that cross-disciplinary field, which then back up and uh, like account for your claim of why your research project would be particularly good. Note that under the status quo, there is an active deprioritization of those certain sets of research. Scientists are either insistently, incessantly rejected from the types of research that would be useful to society because they're a cell speaker, or simply because it is less sexy or less targeted toward humans in the immediacy in a way that makes it easy for universities to publish it in their journals and to publish it to institutions that are looking to fund their research programs. But also, note that scientists are simply likely to shift to other forms of research, which is to say that all kinds of research that are not explicitly publishable, explicitly easy for universities to understand, then gets shifted to the bottom of their prioritization window. That is particularly valuable research, because things like fungal research, research might, like in the context of a changing environment, in the context of climate change, actually be incredibly significant in five years. But a university that is assessing that now has no fucking clue how important a, like particular types of growing patterns of like fungal systems is going to be particularly important. These are types of research that are very difficult to predict their future value. That was important. The last thing I want to note at the end of this speech, since we've proven why we get a more efficient system when we fund different kinds of good research, is that we simply get equal funding, because I think they're likely to make arguments about that. Two ways in which incentives don't change for institutions. Firstly, as a university, your incentives to fund doesn't change because you still care about things like your international rankings, like the preference of institutions to fund your research programs. That meant that you were still likely to care and fund a set of visible projects inherently, but it also means you're likely to do two other things. You're likely to campaign or lobby the government for more funds you can dedicate towards those, towards your total amount of projects, because now you need the important visible sector as well as the 50% randomly allocated. You campaign for more. But it also meant that within your own internal budget, you simply divide it in a way which meant you had a lot more funding going towards research in general because you had to get visible research as well as accounting for that 50% that gets randomly allocated. We got a greater percentage or an equal percentage in total. Uh, for those reasons, very, very proud to propose. Thank you.
All right, I think it's best for them to speak up their seat. I welcome the first negative speaker to begin the negative event. I'll just move the camera a little bit because I don't think you're kind of in frame. Sorry. Not your fault. Research and its associated funding is a finite resource, right? It is, in, in the most cases, a zero-sum game. What does this mean? This means that there is always an opportunity cost when you invest in one thing as opposed to another thing. And there are always associated risks, whether those be risks for investors in investing in these projects in the first place, or just literal risks to the lives of people who may or may not receive things like life-saving treatment or treatment for chronic illnesses when, um, when uh, resources are randomly allocated. What does this mean? This means when, only, when uh, their only minimum requirements matter when you are considering uh, the likelihood of success or like the social utility of a project, projects that would normally receive more funding or priority in funding because they have greater utility, but because they have greater requirements, no longer receive that funding in 50% of the cases under the opposition world because they do have to defend, as much as first affirmative, which I do not believe, they do have to defend a fair degree of structural randomness in the way that these things are happening. Few points um, I've set up uh, first of all. The first thing is just like uh, minimum requirements in general are already not mutually exclusive, pointed out by like ethical requirements, whatever, under the affirmative, uh, uh, first affirmative speaker. But the second thing is like, what would we support? We would support a level of affirmative action in investment in the first place. Things like a quota for like uh, female or racial minorities, uh, particularly in things like medical research, uh, are things that have perceived social utility. And we think a few things also, how research is allocated. The first is on the utility of the research. How many people does it affect? Maybe it's a medical drug, whatever. Second thing is the likelihood of success of the research. That is, investors are more likely to invest in things they get a return on investment on. Expand on that later. The third is the general contribution to scientific knowledge. Perhaps there is a knowledge gap that exists in scientific knowledge that this specific research project will be able to fulfill. And the fourth is just like um, the, the, the gaps in uh, community scientific knowledge allocated as a result. Okay. First argument, why does affirmative team's uh, model lead to worse research? I just want to flag for you that this is the most important thing in the debate for a few reasons. Because the point in which research is selected more arbitrarily and less efficiently, there is an opportunity cost which has meaningful impacts on people's lives. Why is this the case? Well, the first thing we want to tell you is we agree with um, the, the, the ways in which uh, the opposition said you access funding, but we think that there are like a few key things that they miss. We think there are things like think tanks and charities that also invest as private investors who have altruistic motives to invest in things that perhaps have a lower likelihood of success, but perhaps have a greater perceived impact on individuals. Uh, they are the ones that are investing in more sort of like starting re and emerging research rather than fully established research. What do we think the grounds of there are the general private investor invest on research? The first is a return on investment as a result of the usefulness of something like a newly produced medical drug or uh, a high likelihood of success. This means, uh, this, is, this is true for a few reasons. The first is just like uh, businesses and medical professionals like to remain up to date within their practices. They like to uh, be doing the most efficient medical practices possible, the most accurate medical practices possible. First, just because like that is the one that is most likely to treat people and save people's lives the best. And the second is just like, um, that gives them a, uh, a, com a competitive advantage. The second thing is like scale is particularly important for these individuals. That is, they invest more money into things that have a greater impact on more people. And we think that you should weigh this extraordinarily highly in the debate. Because the point at which 50% of research funding is allocated randomly, that is a huge opportunity cost. Because statistically, half of these projects that would normally access funding through the traditional mechanisms of being like a high impact projects, just no longer like receive this funding. So there is two alternatives. The first is like all the super high priority stuff receives funding and the mid priority stuff goes into the random pool, which we still think has a substantial impact on people who are no longer able to reliably access continuity of funding and investment in things that are particularly important. Okay, what we also think is just like um, investors already fund niche or emerging research uh, in, in, in a particularly different way that we think is uniquely good on the house side. We think that when you have niche and emerging research, investors give you a small amount of money to start with that they allow you to prove the viability, success, and utility of your project, and then allocate more money the more successful your project is. Know that this is unique to our side of the house when the opposition said they would fully fund the term of the research regardless of uh, the, the relative uh, perceived success of your project. This means that there is just opportunity for money to be completely wasted under side affirmative. That leads to a literal, uh, tangible impact on people's lives that they get onto. 
Okay. Even if you don't believe all of those things that we told you, we, don't, we told you that you, you have the, we have the ability to just counterfeit all of these things in any way, uh, um, specifically with, ref, with reference to affirmative action stuff. We tell you that there are some people who are just generally interested in fields that they would find. This is because like academics exist on the board of like uh, medical and scientific research institutions. And this responds all of, to all of the material about like, oh, um, researchers will have to like make flashy research as opposed to things they might actually care about. We think there are mechanisms that exist that make people invest, like, invest in altruistic things. Okay, um, why, so um, yeah, what are the impacts of this? The first is just like, um, there is a greater number of people applying for research, right? Because at the point in which you don't have to prove that your research project is the most socially utile or the most useful when compared to other people, you only have to meet a minimum requirement, more people perceive that their research is going to receive funding. That means you get a greater influx of people applying for these research grants. This is a greater amount of bureaucracy that exists on our side of the house. And also know that we just give you the unique ability to pull your investment out of or choose not to invest in things that you deem are not socially utile 100% of the time. The opposition can only do this 50% of the time. So there is that bureaucracy and opportunity cost of the influx of people applying for this random funding. And that means that they get more applications. It is more inefficient. That means there is a greater time lag and that is a particularly um, important impact. We tell you that under affirmative, this means that there is a lower level of overall scrutiny in the research that is done. We think that this means that you have more people faking the viability of their research or being economical with the truth about how impactful their research is to meet minimum requirements. They now no longer have to justify why theirs is the most socially utile product, just that it meets these minimum requirements. What, what, why is this unique to their side of the house? Because on the outside of the house, we can have our investors cut funding at any point, right? Uh, for these non-utile projects that are these more riskier projects. We could just choose not to loan them the greater amount of money after we've given them the, the, the initial amount of money, which means that people have a, a, an incentive not to misrepresent their research, or at the very least, they would only be misrepresenting things like profit incentives, which we think is less important than misrepresenting things like actual social utility and the impact on people's lives. The opposition has to literally prove academic malpractice to remove the, the, the funding from these people, or they just have to cop the harms of their model of funding an investment project for the entire term of the research, even if that thing is not socially used. Yeah, as a result, they get less continuity in research. They get just like less overall like, objectively placed funding in the most important areas. Vulnerable people in things like chronic illness treatment, cancer treatment, clinical trials of, med of medical things, they have to cut the harm of 50% of these cases being randomly updated. Okay, why does this lead to less funding uh, overall? We tell you that at the point that investors who care a lot about their money and a lot about return on investment that I've already flagged for you, they are just less likely to invest in things they have less control over. So when things are randomly allocated, investors, investors no longer have confidence that they're going to be able to choose where their money is allocated. So they just pull their money out as a result. That means that there are more projects competing for a lower investment pool of money, research goes underfunded, or less things just get funded in general. Bad things get funded. That means you get lower quality research on affirmative side, they have to cop this harm. I've already told you why this is the most important harm in the debate. The final thing is this just increases bias under the affirmative team side. We tell you at the point where research mechanisms are already entrenched in like um, sort of uh, the, the scientific research norms of researching into perhaps like white, uh, white male like medical issues. And we have things like endometriosis that affect like one in nine women going criminally under research. That is extraordinarily exacerbated under the opposition side of the house compared to us. Because we've already told you we would include things like affirmative action requirements that are just much fairer and much more utile than the opposition's random allocation. That means we can the ability to uh, organically invest in things that actually matter for a large group of people that goes against the scientific stigma, the opposition has no ability to do this. That is why you must vote side negative in this debate. Thank you.
The negative team to actually accrue benefits from quality of research, they need to do some work to defend the grant system they support so much. First negative does almost no work on this. If they want to tell us that, that money is going to be wasted, that lives are going to be lost, they have to say that the grant system, or at least the grant system that they support, is good at separating projects, uh, separating good projects from bad projects. We give you many reasons at Felix why it's unlikely to be good at this. They are unable to get around with their counter model. Let me recap some of these before I move on to quality of research, because that is where they focus their benefit. Starting on why their grants are quite bad in the status quo. Note that there's just a huge number of people applying for these grants, and there is an inability of those assessing the grants to assess them in a good way. That means that you are likely to be looking at proposals. You're likely to be looking at how well things are presented, how 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 how, um, how, how good the funding is itself, how, how good it's presented in this way. But secondly, you're also just less likely to be as experienced as the researcher who is presenting the funding. These people are likely to be the people who are top of their field. There is a high barrier to entry here. You have to do lots of work to be able to do this research as well. Then you also note that the more competitive grants are as well, there are just a larger number of grants going in, and that means you are less likely to be able to assess them all to their fullest extent. So, to the extent you have just huge numbers of academics applying to these grants, they are unable to all be assessed on the intricate like, benefits they're all able to provide. That is why grants are far more likely to then look at things instead. Note why academics are likely to do things well is all the reason we give you at Felix about the bar to entry for being an academic, about why you've got to be the top of your field. But also just note that academics do just want to be cited. They want their research to be popular enough to get them cited. They want people to buy their books, read their papers, and ask them to collaborate in the future. They want to build their, their status as an academic. There are lots of reasons why academics want to put in good grants, and there are so many grants to go in that they are assessed incredibly poorly by the grant system. This team needs to do work to explain why they are not done as well. Noting that, that the, I guess most of what they set up on their side is just the status quo in terms of likelihood, in terms of all of those sort of things. Note though that they sort of add affirmative action as well. Note this does not get around all of the issues we assess though, uh, we, we explain though, because the like, overwhelming quantity of like of, of research is just still still hard to assess. It's still hard, hard to assess in a really good way, it's still hard to get into the nitty-gritty of it uh, uh, to establish in a really good way. So to the extent that they, that, they, so that they want to claim any benefits to the types of research that does get funding, they need to explain why the grant system is currently good at that. To the extent that they don't, they're unable to claim the benefits there. Now let's look at the quality of research, because this is where they do spend their most of their money. Note that the research, starting firstly with the research that does get funded, uh, I, I, the first thing they tell us is that like funding is a zero-sum game. Right? I just would like to note that I think this is quite an uncharitable characterization of what we give you. I think our framing at Felix is quite clear that the, the, and quite, it's quite well explained. The top 50% of, of, of the most like uh, uh, beneficial and the most societally utile research is, is going to be captured uh, already. Like that, like the 50% it is likely to be captured. It's unlikely that you're going to be losing out on this like life-saving cancer research if it is like, as life-saving, if it is as like certain as it is. So note that the more certain the benefit they claim on that side, the more like certain someone is likely to die on their side, that the more likely it is to be funded on our side, and why that benefit just becomes symmetric. But also note an additional structural reason on why the top 50% of research is, why this, this important research is likely to be in the top 50%, is that breakthroughs often don't happen with enormous amounts of funding, they happen in incremental ways. You find something small that develops into a further study. It doesn't necessarily mean you give billions and billions of dollars and then you automatically find a cure to cancer. You might find one thing that is slightly more effective than something you've tried in the past. Those small incremental steps of funding are likely to not include large amounts of funding, and to the extent they are promising, they're almost certainly likely to be funded as well. Next, so, so in the end, most of the really beneficial things that do on our side actually just do get captured in that 50% as well. But note the things that don't get captured are the things that are like less, less, less likely to be popular, less likely to, like the uni's less likely to be able to put on their marketing research, like, like, like research into why like poorer people are more unhealthy or, or like why like there are certain aspects of our like society that are like, affected in different ways. Like uh, these sort of things are like unlikely for universities to try to try and capture. Uh, and the things that are just less sexy research or politically unpopular, or just note the things that may seek to stack, challenge the status quo but are like unpopular. Explaining why such certain policies that we've had entrenched in our society for certain years do like do really powerful things. 
or even things that just aren't medical biology, things that don't affect humans but are really important, like ecosystems, like the, the riparian biology along the riverbeds that like increase pollution in our rivers. Those sort of things are equally as important as these human aspects anyway. So under their side, like it, it's unlikely you get these really crucial things that are just less popular. Under both sides, we're almost certainly likely to get the things that are really beneficial. What we do is we increase the chance of getting that research to really bad. Okay, then they say charities and private funding are often likely to uh, fund things that are uh, less established or more speculative. Note that I actually just don't think this is true, and I think this is broadly asserted by them. I think, note firstly though, this is not the majority of grants you're getting. The majority of grants do come from your university institution and do come from the government, rather than coming from, from, that, from, from private donors. But secondly though, I would note that private donors are, have far more perverse incentives, like to the extent they don't care about their e the, the ecosystems of the society society, they want something that is going to be, like, to be able to say, look, I'm, I'm a really rich person and I funded research that's going to save a bunch of lives because it cures cancer. That's what they want. They're incentive to R for this name recognition to that as well. But also just know, I think, that they can just fund things anyway, to the extent they have a pet project, to the extent they, to the extent they think something is really hash, like, important on their side, they can do it as well. Uh, they also tell us that like, it's, it's likely that more people then apply to, to grants under our side and make things worse. I just think it's hard to see who these people who are not applying to the status quo that then start applying because of the published and perished nature of academia. That is just the reason you have like a large number of applications at the moment. It's unclear where they're getting extra people applying from as well. Then they just sort of tell us that like there's no you no longer need to justify how good your research is, and, and that means you're unable to like cut it off if it's bad. And no, I don't think that we can do just cut it off if the research in its eventuation doesn't meet a minimum, minimum, minimum standard. Like there are just some standards as well. But I think secondly, this analysis hinges on grants being able to assess whether they assess these standards in a really good way as well. So at the end of that, I think that you are just like unlikely to get lots of research into things that are socially utile, but aren't as sexy, aren't as best beneficial. The next thing we tell you at Felix about why research gets better, they just do not respond to, is why academics no longer have to waste their time applying for grants, because instead of academics doing further literature research onto this project, onto what then is existing in the status quo to direct their research. They are instead sift, like, sifting through potential grants they can apply to. They are instead writing up fancy proposals and get fancy presentations. Instead of focusing on this like, funding for this project, they're thinking about what am I going to do next? How am I going to have a job tomorrow? They are unable to dedicate as much time to the research in the, its, its, its um, pure sense. And instead, you are far more likely to then just uh, spend more time like, on the grant itself, which is like less likely to create conducive conditions for good research, because you're focusing on making the grant sexy rather than making the research good. Finally, though, I think the other thing we tell you the Felix is why we just get more money for them, and that is because you have universities who want to increase the pool of funding so that 50% pool of funding just gets bigger, and that means they are going to still capture all those things. Not only the government has the exact same incentives here, particularly when universities are lobbying the government for this as well. To so say the government wants to fund projects through the grant system, they're likely to fund them as well because they see that the full, the full collection of like, research is something they want to fund, they're going to provide that funding anyway. And that is why we get better research on our side.
I'm going to explain two things in this speech. First, the unbiased, second of all, on issue efficiency and the allocation of resources. Note this entire second affirmative speech is symmetric if the current reform system is so bad. You still have to bear the all reversible and average cost that it has on the 50% certainty. And I will note that to you that the only non symmetrical uh, delta in this debate is that we have 100% certainty on our side. Those grants institutions are more likely to give altruistic funding, they're more likely to be risk like taking, they're more likely to be innovative, they're more likely to use allocated and like remaining funding in order to do some, do some fluffy stuff, do some risk taking stuff, and do some niche stuff. The delta in this debate is that when you only have 50% certainty of your funding, where are you going to allocate this funding? Is that you're more likely to be more rapidly killed because you know that you only have 50% of certainty, you want to give that certainty to people who are reputationable, you're more likely to be biased, and you're more likely to be racist because you want absolute certainty in the only remaining 50% certainty you can grab. That would say, currently in the status quo, all this feminism and women's research, all this research that do not have any direct and tangible or short-term benefits, are more likely to be skilled and throw into the pool of luxury. They're more likely to be thrown into the pool of arbitrary and unfairness. And in my speech, I'm going to impact you. Why? The overall fuck of minority research as a whole. First of all, you squeeze the scope you could allow alternative uh, like actions and diversity for the uh, like niche market and like indigenous research on our side. Because you would just say that obviously we don't need a diversity quota anymore. They can just go into the lottery system, and if you're lucky, they're more likely to get it. So you obviously waste the fiat and the capital on their side. So obviously they do not, they will not ever get affirmative action and like quota on their side. And it's too late for Sway to respond to that argument. I think secondly, the reason why it's really bad when they go into our alternative lottery system is that you need to understand this minority research and research on like liberal arts and research on like feminism or etc. They're just statistically disproportionately small in the sense of so when they're entering into the lottery system. That would say they're statistically less likely to be paid from like being granted the uh, in the funding. That would say the part of our side is that right now these institutions have like probably 25% of the quota they can allocate to this minority. But the counterpart on their side is that they're just going to be thrown into a lottery system where they systematically will not be paid because they have such a small representation in the entire research funding because academics is sexist and racist. And I think third of all is that during the process you're waiting for your research proposal because we already told you that the structure of bureaucracy. There's a higher timeline. That is to say. Oh, after you submit a proposal, it takes longer time to get back to you. We're seeing these minority researchers are the people who are likely to be burned out because they do not have alternative research network or alternative things to support their life. They're the person who are likely to give up this career and move into private sector or move into other sector. That will say the impact of the bias argument is that on their side, they significantly fuck it up and they significantly discourage minority researchers into investigating in these areas at the very beginning. So I'm not saying the word minority researchers. I'm not saying like people of color researchers. I'm more likely to say like those like niche and risky. The taking example I previously said. What does this impact tell you? Is that first of all, feminism and uh, like human rights organizations and think tank are no longer having the autonomy in, like to like invest directly into the projects like uh, like they want to do. That is to say, their funding have to go into the pool, and they currently do not have such a huge amount of funding. That is to say, the funding you're giving to these feminism projects, feminism research, are significantly less oversight because they have to go into the public like allocated and aggregate research pool. They decide from the time you so you first of all take away the autonomy and the certainty that these organizations can have on tangible outcome for lots of research programs. And I think second, second of all is that uh, it's incredibly important for lots of niche diseases and like small risk taking therapy that is not deep as aggregately social youth health who will not be prioritized into the 50%. But we think that these projects are incredibly important for those people who have niche disease because they're already structurally disadvantaged of not having enough treatment. That is say you're like taking away the treatment they're probably uh, like more capable of having on our side. So now dealing with, f finishing dealing with the bias, I think the past victory we have is already very certain on this. I'm going to move on to second of all, shit on them about why they actually waste lots of money into giving to shit researchers. The other response that only a time we get from side of the is that they try to use the fiat to explain why this minimum requirement is likely to be done in a good way. First of all, we're saying that the minimum research requirement is unlikely to be done in a good way because you technically do not have so much human capital and so many people who have the expertise to like, like go through this minimum requirement. This minimum requirement is just likely to be like, oh, you have method, conclusion, introduction, and it's explained in a sort of and comprehensive way. Then we say those minimum requirements is probably not enough as what side of them they wanted to mitigate all those harms. And second of all, I think two way talk about how our grant system is really bad because you have a few huge inflights flexing in. I think they shoot themselves in the food because we're already proven to you at the first affirmative that you're likely to have a huge inflight and there will be a bureaucracy of like granting this. That would say even though they have 
capacity and they have this miraculously fear to prove that those people are so expertise. It is structurally impossible for them to comprehensively differentiate between research grants because the amount of workload you have in every day is significantly larger. So you're more likely to like, oh, actually understand the nuances behind a particular methodology and to do some additional research into like a project that seems like, oh, I've never seen this before. You're more likely, you're less likely to take an aspiring view as a, like a grant proposal in order to go through this project. What is the alternative? The alternative on their side is that even though they're capable of maintaining good minimum requirements, first of all, you have a huge time lag. That is to say, I submit a proposal today in the status quo in the grant system. I will get it back in three months. However, on their side, it's likely to get it back to them in one year. What is the harm of this and what is the implication of this argument? First of all, lots of people will just leave during the period of royal waiting. So you obviously have a capital like human flight and like brain drain in your research category. And I think second of all, there's a lot likely to have a huge burnout, especially into this development department who are already not popular in the status quo because people are tired of the anxiety of waiting. People are tired of the arbitrary, uh, arbitrary nature of the system. They're likely to say, oh, it is more arbitrary in the status quo. No, in the status quo, you have feedback for improvement when your proposals are being rejected. What does it mean? That we actually have more and better researchers, not only research quality as a whole, because when you get rejected, you have a thorough explanation from those big up to say, oh, what exactly did I do wrong? And you can take this feedback to tangibly improve your research and to fit it in their requirements. So your next research proposal is very certain that likely to be granted. And you're actually going to have a project that you're so passionate about doing on, on their side. However, on their side, if you get rejected, nobody's going to explain it to you. You're not going to have feedback. You're not going to have a tangible improvement on their side. So researchers leave to other private industry. You will never get better research on their side. I think second of all, they talk about racism and bias. I think racism and bias have checks and balances in the status quo. That is say you're likely to appeal to the academic board because you're like, oh, just because I'm an ESL speaker, so I'm like, like fuck, and they're like, I'm like, not taking it seriously. You obviously have checks and balances. You can appeal. And that is the reason why how academia is getting better in the 21st century, because you have a voice channel to talk to them instead of being a uh, uh, letting your face be determined in an arbitrary lottery system. Now, let's move on to the second flash on efficiency. Their claim is that you must spend less time for, uh, like, waiting for the next, for, like, branding for the next grant, and it will actually improve the research quality. With this argument, first of all, lots of professors will just do something called research slicing. They will say they slice one particular research into different sizes in order to increase the statistics, because they know if they increase the statistics and the number of research, research that is in the grant pool, you're more likely to get it. So you're actually not getting better quality of research. You just have like, a big dog slicing the research into 10, and they're probably just going to get it because they have the capacity of like slicing their research into 10, right? They're obviously still going to grant their proposal. And I would say, they actually have the better capacity to make their grant sexy, so they can just make 10 sexy good grants in order to squeeze of like the young professor, etc. Second of all, I think it's especially bad for young researchers because like previously young researchers can just be like sexy and attractive. And I don't think like sexy and attractive is necessarily a bad thing as side of negative tells you. But right now they are unlikely to like have a comparative advantage just because they're sexy and like a good. Finally, talking about why the current status quo is really good enough. So grant is not perfect, but obviously a lot of it's first because grant system has very good incentive. They use taxpayers' money, which means that they are, have to be publicly beneficial. Yes, our speaker bias is actually not that huge. All my Chinese friends are like pretty like acing in Europe and UCLA computer science. I just don't think academic is so like language semantic. And third of all, altruistic organizations obviously care about all time. So and finally, being attractive in your brand is a premise for being a good quality research that shows that you actually have the time to dedicate to your project. And safety methods probably means like innovation or etc. That is it on our side. We overall get better research. So proud to close. Alright, I welcome the third bonus of speaker to conclude the moment of bench meeting. Because they are worse than being random. But also, even things like pure. 
Google Maps have implications for computer science, for things like, like the way that language works and stuff like that. Philosophy has implications for government policy. All this stuff is useful in the long term. They cannot just kind of get away with this debate by saying this research is useless. We would say that even the most useless research that is theoretical is often quoted in literature reviews of incredible, incredible practical papers because it sets the basis for where they guide their research in the future. Okay, on quality. Notably, this is firstly contingent on their sorting system working, which I will prove later that it doesn't. Uh, so any of this stuff is, I guess, best case scenario, uh, best case scenario analysis for them. But notably, the best research is likely to be funded in either world. They tell you that there is likely to be bias right now. I think if people are producing good research that's beneficial for governments or the corporations that are funding it, or for universities, regardless of their background, it's likely to be funded. And we've said this from the very beginning of the debate. But we also tell you most research is and would be good regardless of whether or not it's randomly funded or funded by the system, because people who do it have PhDs because they want to get citations, because they want to get published in journals, which is how they get their name out. But also because the model is just like probably like the model is probably good at sort of setting like a level. Like I think we are able to use the model and have a reasonable amount of data to determine that we would I guess cut out totally useless research as we said at first affirmative, I don't think the model bash is that like there. Like it just doesn't make sense why scientists would take the system. They don't take the money they get from grants and run with it and give it to themselves. They have to use it on the research that they're actually making. So all the sort of kind of like vibe debating that they're doing by saying that this research would be bad and scientists would just do bad projects is just not explained given scientists have the incentive to do very good research projects and we prove that to you from the first from the first speech in the debate. But unfortunately some of this research despite being good is in the status quo of systematically being deprioritized because the writing is not clear and they say, well, the writing doesn't have to be clear, they're doing well in their tests. But notably, grad research projects are writing for a person who is not in the same field as you, who's not doing their best to understand you, who has thousands of grads they have to prioritize. Notably, if your writing is less clear than someone else and they have to spend more time trying to understand it, that is a mark against your name. But notably as well, being an ESL speaker is not necessarily being a person of color. So affirmative action requirements don't automatically benefit that and doesn't mean you're necessarily doing research on issues that are related to people of color as well. So it's unclear that any of their AA stuff would necessarily work there. We also tell you that stuff about cross-disciplinary research doesn't have the background to make it appear as significant as it might be because it cannot draw upon past research to indicate how it might be useful in the future. All this means that random would be better in this instance than what occurs in the status quo. We think there is probably a lot of some research that does decrease in value. We would say a lot of that research is likely relatively similar to each other, doing relatively small things differently from each other because it is consistently prioritized as the most important research. We say it's probably not a big deal if two researchers doing something very smallly differently doesn't happen. One research could probably get a little bit more money to do both of those things in their same research project. We would say it's much more better, like, you know, for example, if they're doing two small different, like, two, two small different experiments where they change the concentration of an acid slightly. One scientist could test both of those things. They don't both need grant money. Um, Finally, the push here is that this would create bias in the system because all research done by people from marginalized backgrounds would end up getting pushed to the randomness. Firstly, in the status quo, grants are still blind, right? So there's unlikely to be particular bias towards someone's background beyond the things that are obvious, that is someone's language usage and stuff like that. Uh, we would make, continue to make those grants blind. Like if people want to apply for grants and their research is useful, I guess it would continue to occur in either world. So it's unclear why, if there is a problem, they get any money right now. I think it's just unclear why this changes in either world. But also, I do think it's just reasonable for me to say that where they would put AA requirements in their research and where they would be beneficial, we could also do the same thing. The reason why this is reasonable at third term is because that model was not clear until second negative as to how this AA would actually work. And notably, models have to be, uh, like, what's the word? They have to be, like, uh, mutually exclusive. And the model of having affirmative action on their side for grant priorities is not mutually exclusive because we can do that for the 50% grants under our side of the house as well. The impact of this issue on quality is that things that are useful, that they just do not explain are not useful, get the opportunity to be visible when they are systematically deprioritized right now in the world. And obviously that is beneficial because it means these small, small iterations of process can actually get research and can actually exist in the future. I think there are ample explanations and examples at the previous two speakers in my speeches to make this point. There's little explanation from the negative team as to why that would not be the case. So I do not think that they can win this debate on just hand waving away and saying, useful re useless research is bad. Secondly, on quantity of funding, they haven't done a lot of work on this, but it never does the uh, negative. Here's like, I guess, the preemptive responses to this as well. A lot of their case is medically framed, which I just think is quite interesting, because notably, direct funding from companies, like pharmaceutical companies, to research institutions is likely to stay the state on both sides of this house. This debate is about grant funding, not about all research funding entirely, which means direct funding for particular projects is likely to remain symmetric. This is about institutions that have an incentive that they want research to be done, but they don't really have a priority or an incentive for particular research 
to occur in either world. They don't really care. So we explained to you from first speaker that unis often still want that 50% of research that they can choose to be funded. So they then have to double their funding to make sure that they can fund all that good, important research that looks good for them. And therefore have to keep the funding the same for everything else. The same thing goes for governments. The government is aware that the grant system is pretty bad because people my age are hired by the public service to like assess those grants, right? I think they'd be perfectly happy to have that be a random process alternatively, but also of course they are again benefited and society is benefited by the 50% of research that is deemed the most important. So it is likely to remain the same in either world, and I kind of mostly classify that as pretty pushed by third negative if, if it's made there. Finally, on efficiency. Why is the grant system inefficient in the status quo? We tell you the biggest reason is that there are a huge number of people applying. It makes the ability of assessing really hard. They say, well, more people would apply because it's easier. We would say, firstly, there's already likely to be saturation in the status quo. That is because the only way that you can get money for your research as an academic is through applying to a grant either through a university or through a government grant as a whole. So it's unclear why you can increase the amount of people applying to such a great degree. Then they tell you, well, we'd split it into smaller projects, and that would mean there's more saturation there so people can get more money. Notably, when you split it into smaller projects, A, the ability for you to cross the significance barrier that we do set decreases with the amount that you split the project into small pieces. But also, notably, it just doesn't make sense for you as a scientist, because if you get one of those small parts of your project approved, that project is likely to be shorter and gets less money, and it means that you have smaller capacity as a scientist to be able to continue that research into the future. So you have to wait then for the next piece of the project that you applied for to be applied. It much, makes much more sense to do a seven year project and get it funded once and then have seven years of continued funding. But finally, we also yeah, point out there is the minimum standard that we would tell you. We also tell you that there is prioritized given to the writing, but also that there is a very important capacity gap. That is the people who are assessing this research are not the experts and the scientists in the field. So even with the best writing in the world, sometimes they do not understand what the implications of the research might be. Sometimes the scientists themselves don't understand what the implications of their research might be in another field because they are biologists, they are not medical scientists, scientists in particular, so don't necessarily understand specifically what the use might be, but understand generally that might, generally that might have benefits as well. They tell you that there might be some risk-taking uh, groups that still want to give money to these things. We would say if they're directly giving money, they are likely to do it in either world. We said government and the universities are likely to give it in either way. We also tell you that some of this risk-taking is just not likely to cover the entire risk-taking sorts of in, sorts of research that is likely to occur, but also we would just say that the types of incentives that we give you for the certain types of research to be deprioritized in the status quo is still likely to occur for risk-taking institutions because they obviously, as they tell you, still want their ROI and return on investment. This is not about like, whether or not the research is risky, I guess. It's about how far in the future there are benefits. And often it's not immediately clear so institutions are still likely to deprioritize anyway. They finally tell you get feedback. Obviously, you get feedback for the minimum standards anyway. Unclear why it's different. You say it's better if people aren't changing. Obviously, if their motor doesn't work, it doesn't matter. We're so proud to have affirmed. in 30 second slots within their speeches why research into fungi, pollution and pure maths is good, I think an academic who's dedicated their entire life to studying it certainly can explain it, not just to the average reasonable person, but to an experienced board that's responsible for determining research. The data on site affirmative is very vague and uncertain, which is to say, by their own characterization, this research is perhaps useful or it's uncertain what the benefit would be, but we should at least give it a shot. Comparatively, the delta on our side is much more meaningful because the amount of money that you have to spend on research is finite. Research itself is always risky and an uncertain investment. And at the point which you have less funding for that research, at the point which you have to uh, front the opportunity cost of putting it into less socially utile and more uncertain things, that is a massive harm. 
Because things that, that get overlooked on the side of affirmative are things that are certainly meaningful. They're things which boards, even if they're imperfect boards, would identify as being socially futile. They're drugs that people need. They're chronic conditions that we don't have enough research on. That is a much more important thing in this debate than the possibility of something being relevant to an academic field, maybe in the future. I'm going to ask two questions in this speech. The first is, what is the current grant system of funding like and how did it shift? And the second is on efficiency. Firstly, on the current grant system of funding, I want to note here that I do just think we can win on the highest burden in this debate, which is to say, even if you believe all of their analysis that sometimes these boards are imperfect at determining what things are useful, and there exists a set of things which are, the utility is not very obvious but it's perhaps good and meaningful to invest in it. I do just think it's legitimate to trade these things off for things that are more obviously socially futile because I just do not think it is that difficult to determine whether the potential social utility of a scientific project is meaningful because often it's very easily concretized and academics themselves dedicate their lives to pitching why this research is important. They liaise with other academics at other institutions to indicate why it's likely to be useful. If the delta in this debate is occasionally things that are useful in uh, academic circles have to get traded off, I think that that is fine because I think knowledge in and of itself is perhaps not innately valuable or socially utile. I think it's important that people on the ground have access to research that is important to them and does actually save their lives. But secondly, I would suggest that this team is uncomparative in their analysis. They say, well, you can't uh, assess everything at the moment to the full and perfect extent. Sure, but at least you engage in some form of assessment. Like, it's unclear why the alternative has to be complete and utter randomness. Perhaps you can do things like, uh, like, uh, like insert all the things we tell you at first negative that, that we would do, like require assessments based on the like prospect of future development or the social utility of it. That's all analysis that we give at Christian. Those are things that we are able to require these boards to assess on the basis on, even if you don't believe they do it at the moment. But I would note that, uh, that the problem with this team is they just default to saying, well, sure, there's a delta and a trade-off in this space, but that's fine because you can just capture it in the other 50% of the research. But this is obviously uncomparative because this team has to fund not just the uh, amount of studies being done, but the like, the volume of money and funding that you get dedicated to it. And I think it is bizarre to suggest that your most socially utile and most promising research now has to get an equal amount of funding to things that are random. I think it is far more reasonable and far more intuitive to determine that funding based on a needs basis and based on the likelihood of that research being successful. I would suggest in a pandemic, for instance, I would want the vast majority of new academic grants going towards things like vaccines, towards investigating that disease. Under their side, they have to talk that half of that just goes away. It's extremely unclear from this affirmative team why the remaining 50% of funding is sufficient in order to capture these socially utile things. I would suggest that that is an arbitrary marker. We should let boards, even if they are imperfect in our worst case scenario, determine that funding because it's better than nothing. But the question then becomes, what about the less sexy but still good things? What about the fun guy? Firstly, I do just think that this can be pitched well. Like, it's extremely unclear to me why if there is a genuine promise of this being meaningful research, an academic would not be able to convey that. And sure, in the instances where a board sometimes dismisses it because they think it is less promising, I think that is a legitimate reason to dismiss it because when you are reviewing thousands of applications and you have to compare them against one another, and when the amount of money that you have to give to these research projects is finite, sometimes you do just have to make those trade-offs about what is more socially utile. And I think it's legitimate to trade off things that are more uncertain because uh, research is by, by necessity a risky investment. It's unclear what the return on your investment will be. Often, by this team's characterization, research is unexpected in its findings, and that means having certainty in your investment is exceptionally important. That is the thing that means that governments continue to fund you and private investors continue to fund you. But secondly, I just contest that these boards are stupid. I often think academics are on these boards, uh, and by this team's analysis, they have to have some form of process for academics being on these boards in order to ensure these minimum standards that they want. But I think that the, the investors like governments and private research entities are just unlikely to continue to grant money to boards that make bad assessments whose research has an uh, ongoing history of resulting in no findings or not being useful. I think these boards are held to external standards in ways that are important. But thirdly, I do just think niche, niche subsidies exist. Like, I, I know this debate isn't about philosophy, but like UCIT has PhD subsidies for specific women philosophers that people research because there are charities and activist groups that actually really care about that kind of research existing in the world. And this team has to uh, front the fact that that research now has to, that, the, 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 those niche subsidies now have to get randomly distributed. So it's exceptionally unclear to me why you wouldn't be able to get this research under the status quo. What changes then? Who starts applying? We tell you that they compound the efficiency problem because now researchers need to win what is essentially a random lottery. So they attempt to rig it in their favor. It means that they send like five iterations of what is essentially the same study 
money in to get reviewed, which clog the process of ethical review boards. They do things like think, well, my you know, pet interest or something that I'm very academically interested in, but isn't particularly meaningful to anyone else but me or my immediate colleagues, is something I can now get research for when I would otherwise not be able to get it approved by a board. That means there's a massive increase in the volume of funding. And the people that win out in this numbers game are the departments that are already the largest, the departments that are already dominated by the greatest number of academics, the departments whose academics have the security of tenure to ongoingly make grant applications. And that is a harm because it entrenches a bias in academia. It entrenches a bias against women and people of color. I think that, that is a massive, massive harm. Then on efficiency, I've already talked a little bit about this, but I do just think this is an area where we win the clearest because this team now has to contend with a massive influx of the volume of applications being put through. And sure, they don't have to assess those applications to the same level of severity, but the overwhelming efficiency harm is in the initial stages of application, which is to say ethical review boards, which you have to pass under their side, often only meet like once or twice a year. They're incredibly slow. There are very few qualified people to engage in them because they're held to exceptionally high academic standards, which means that the cost to all academic research is so much larger on their side, because now the other 50% of research, or the uh, research that would remain the same in both worlds, still has to be subjected to a longer process of approval, and that is a massive harm, because it means that people's capacity to get research more uh, effectively and more efficiently uh, is just delayed. The team, This team does the delay for you, so I don't have to explain why efficiency is good, it's their own good win metric. Uh, I think that this team subjects academics who spend their entire lives to explaining why their research is good and meaningful to a lottery of chance that they cannot win. Even if you believe these ethical review boards are perfect, you should believe that they have some level of common sense. And in a context where the amount of money that you have to spend on research is uniquely finite, you should believe that social utility is the most important thing. Even if we have to cop the fact that sometimes uh, chance-based, rare scientific discoveries won't happen, I think that that is legitimate if it means that things that are socially obvious, like finding cures for chronic diseases, are prioritised in our world. I think that that is the clearest path to victory for side negative, and you should believe it's one that we've been on. Alright, thanks everyone um, for that great debate. Uh, across the floor, shake hands and leave the room while we deliver.